Today, I want to take some of those questions that you gave to me, and I want to answer some of those questions. Now, some of this may be, ah, oh, blah, 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 blah. He's trying to be a college professor, and I really don't care about all this stuff. But I think it's very important that we know what we believe. We should know what the church stands for. If somebody says, what does Glenville believe? Uh, I, don't, I don't know. We should know what we believe. So today I want to take a few minutes and answer some questions, and I hope that at the end of this, you'll say, yeah, I didn't know that, or yes, I'm affirming that that's what I believe and that's where I should belong. You know, because I believe when we identify ourselves with the body, with the church, we should somewhat know what the church believes. So today I'm just going to sit down and I'm going to talk to you a little bit. So if you have your Bibles, let's turn to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, and we'll start with verse 12. Ephesians 4, verse 12. The body of the church is to equip people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. Equipping people to do service. Equipping people to do the building up of the church, the body of Christ. When we build each other up, when we look at each other and say, how can I encourage you? There's things that we need to know. So the first question that was asked to me on the church is, what is the church's statement of faith? What does the church believe? I know how we preach, and I know what we believe as far as in the sermons, but when, when the rubber hits the road, and, and what does the church believe? If, if we are going to be in a battle about doctrines of the church, what does the church believe? What is the church's statement of faith? And let me give you that answer, and then I want to break them down. What is the statement of faith? Glenville believes in a supernatural Bible, which tells of a supernatural Christ, who has a supernatural birth, who spoke supernatural words, who performed supernatural miracles, who lived in a supernatural life, who died a supernatural death, and rose in supernatural power. That is the biblical constitution that we hold on to. So what are those things? The first thing is the scriptures. What do we believe about the Bible? If you have your Bible, raise your, raise your Bible up. If you have your phone, you can raise your phone up. There you go, Tim. <laughs> Whatever you use, whether it's a phone, whether it's an iPad, or whether it's your Bible, it's not what you hold in your hand, it's the words that are in your hand. It's the very words. Now, a long time ago, it'd be at this church and many other churches, it had to be a certain version that we had to hold on to. But those are the scriptures. We believe that the Holy Bible was written by men supernaturally inspired. That is the truth without any admixture of error for its matter. And therefore it is and shall remain to the end of this age the only complete and final revelation of the will of God towards man. So here's what we say. It's not my opinion, nor is it your opinion. The thing that we hold on to is God's word. Whether we like what the Bible says, or we even agree with what the Bible says, the word of God is our absolute authority that we hold on to. So if somebody would say to you, I know what the Bible says, but, I'm sorry, I may not necessarily like what I have to do because of the word of God, but I can't change what the Word of God says. All we are is ambassadors to fulfill the Word of God. It is holy men of God, supernaturally inspired the Word of God. And then, what about the true God? In our society today, the, the, the idea of what true God is, we believe that there is one and only one living and true God, an infinite intelligent spirit, the maker of the supreme ruler of heavens and earth, inexpressibly glorious in holiness and worthy of possible honor, confidence, and love. That is, in the unity of the Godhead, there are three distinct persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, equal in every divine perfection, but ex executing distinct and harmonious offices of the redemption of mankind. We believe in the Godhead. There's not many gods. There's a God, and through that God, there's three distinct persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, which leads us to what do we believe about the Spirit? You know, in, sometimes in Baptist churches of the past, the Holy Spirit was never mentioned because of the charismatic movement. We were afraid to be associated with the charismatic movement, and that was such a, a, a farce because the Holy Spirit is the, the indwelling of God within our hearts and within our lives. 
And if we have the Holy Spirit within our lives, we can do great things. We believe that the Holy Spirit is a divine person, equal with God and with the Father, and God the Son, and the same in nature, that he is active at creation, that he is the relation of us being believing, and the restraints from evil in our life. And the purpose is to fulfill, to convict of us our sins, and the judgment of his righteousness. He is the indwelling power, the sealer of our salvation. That is what the Holy Spirit is. When we speak, he can correct us. When we do, he can, he can empower us. And he is the seal of our understanding of our salvation. The Holy Spirit is very important. Equal with God and equal with the Father, but in distinct different offices. And then, what do we believe about Satan? Um, there, there's a book that some of us men have gone over in the past called Bondage Breaker. And in that book called The Bondage Breaker, there's two things. Either Satan is around every corner and everything is caused by Satan. And everything that we look at, Satan is causing. Or we make Satan look like a fairy tale and we make believe of him that he's not true. And I believe Satan is real. And I believe he is the adversary. And he may not be causing every situation within our life, but he is in the midst of this broken world. We believe that Satan was once holy and enjoyed heavenly honors. But through pride and ambition to be as almighty, he fell and drew with him a host of angels. That he is now uh, the prince and the power of this era and an unholy God of this world. We hope to be the man's greatest tempter, the enemy of God and his Christ, the accuser of the saints and the author of false religions. He is real. We believe that. We need to stand against him. And then what do we believe about creation? If you go to any popular school today or any, any uh, public school, this creation has always been fought. But we believe the word of God, the first principle, that the truth is the very word of God. We believe that in the Genesis account of creation, that it is to be accepted literally and not allegorically or figuratively, that a man was created directly in God's own image and after this, his likeness. We believe that we are created by God for a purpose. And God created the heavens in there, and he created us, because that's what the Bible says in Genesis. But then, the fall of man. We believe that man was created in innocence, under the law of his maker, but by voluntary transgression fell from the sinless and happy state, in the consequence of which we all mankind are now sinners. By this, constraint, but by choice. And that is why Jesus had to die. Because sin entered the world, now we have Jesus coming into the world. And he comes in through the virgin birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. We believe that Jesus Christ was begotten by the Holy Ghost in a miraculous manger, born of Mary a virgin, as no other man was ever born or can ever be born of woman. And that's what Christmas is all about, that God became man who dwelt among us. And then the atonement of sin, but after he was born, he died. The atonement of sin, because of mankind's death, we believe that God had to have a redemptive plan, and that redemptive plan was through his son, Jesus Christ, being born through a virgin, lived 33 years, died on the cross to cover our sins. We believe that the salvation of sinners is holy of grace. The Son of God, who by appointment of the Father, freely took upon him our nature, yet without sin, honored the divine law of his personal obedience, and his death made full, vicarious atonement for our sins. It is what we live for is to honor him. And then, what do we believe about the church? We believe that Glenville is the congregation of baptized believers, associated by the covenant of which the fellowship of the gospel. We believe the true mission of the church is found in the Great Commission. First, to make disciples. Second, to build up the church. And third, to teach and instruct at his command. We believe the church is very important. It's God's institution for the spiritual condition of our life. What do we do with what we have? If we believe all those things, are they just things that we know in the back of our head or are things that we put into practice? It is something that we should put into practice. So the second thing the question that question was asked to me is, what are the expectations upon church members? What are the expectations? Um, I, have been, I have had the privilege uh, of being the pastor here for 19 years. I was 34 years old when I became pastor. I, I was green, I was young, I, I thought I knew how to pastor a church. And somebody, tell me, let me tell you how to do it. And I, I would 
call other pastors and I'd tell them how to do everything. It did not take me long to realize I didn't know jack about pastoring a church. I didn't know anything. I thought I did. And the one thing that taught me more than anything else is humility is through service. And you don't tell somebody what to do. You show them how to do it. The Bible says to equip the saints to do the work of the ministry. And one of the greatest things that we can do is be humbled in our action. And I believe God humbled me in a great way when it talked about church membership. Uh, our church early on, 19 years ago, uh, it was struggling. It was struggling. There was, had some calamities go on in the church, some issues, and uh, had a couple church splits, and people get mad over different issues. And, and the church, Glenville, was struggling emotionally and spiritually. Financially, it was, it was struggling. And um, I came in, and I was green. I said, you got the right guy for the job. Tell me the problems, and I'll try to fix it. And man, was I naive. What I knew how to do is love people. I knew how to serve people. I didn't know everything about how to fix all the problems. I didn't know all the budget issues. But I knew that, you know what, as long as I got a hold of God, and as long as I preached Jesus, and as long as I served individuals, God would take care of the church. I was the pastor here for about five years, and the church was doing really good. And all of a sudden, a major calamity took place, and in one year, we lost about 50 members. And I was like, wow. Um, never experienced that before. I mean, I liked when people came in the doors, but it hurt when people walked out of those doors. Because I take every person that leaves the church personal. I mean, it hurts. Um, so when you look at people walking in and people walking out and the struggles of the church... What are the expectations of members? What should we do? What, is, what, what, when you join the church, what is the purpose of that? And in Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47, um, it tells us a little bit, and then I want to give you some of the distinctives that I believe every church member should do to be part of the body of Christ. In verse 41, it says, Then those who gladly, <laughs> with anticipation, received his word were baptized. And that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in the fellowship and in the breaking of bread and in prayers. Then fear came upon every soul. And many wonders and signs were done through the apostles. Now all who believed were together and had all things in common and sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all who had need. So continually, daily, with one accord in the temple... And breaking of bread from house to house, they ate their food and with gladness and with simplicity of heart, praising God and the Father for the favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. God adds to the church who God wants within the church. So what is the purpose, the expectation of church membership? Let me tell you what the church needs. The church needs fellowship. Well, that's, a, that's an old school word for relationship. We just need to have a relationship. We need to know each other. We need to pray for each other. The song that Justin just sang at the end, it, in the eye of the storm, when everything falls apart, when you get the bad news of what's going on, what do we have? We have a physical family that we're born into, but the Bible says that the church is the spiritual family that comes alongside you, that can pray with you, that it can encourage you, that can help you. It is the fellowship. And then the second thing the church does and what we can do corporately as a member is worship. Is worship. And early on, it, it makes no difference how you worship. Whether you raise your hands and you praise to God with hands raised high or you bow your head with a humbled state. Or if you're like me, you don't want anybody to hear your song because they would laugh at you. You just sit and you do the lips, the Christian lip sync. You know, I move my lips, but nothing comes out. And I, I told the sound guys, if you ever turn my microphone on during the worship service, somebody's in trouble. Somebody's in trouble because I love to worship. I just don't know how to sing. So I just make a joyful noise unto the Lord all you land. Serve the Lord with gladness. I can do that. We can worship. And worship gives intimacy with God. And then here's the key with every church member is evangelism. Our job as a member of the church 
is not to be happy in church. The job of the member of the church is to bring others alongside the journey with us. What God has done for you, we can introduce others to that same salvation and that same joy. Evangelism is bringing people with us. Not necessarily going out and preaching on the street corner, which some of you have the personality and the temperament to do. But many of us have the friendship evangelism mindset. I can invite. I can bring in. I can encourage. So we have fellowship. We have worship. We have evangelism. And then here's what Jesus says. My house shall be a house of, what is it? Prayer. We the body of Christ, the greatest tool that we have is prayer. When members of the church pray for each other, encourage one another, and love each other, it is a house of prayer. And then it's a house that we can be discipled in. And Pastor Al does a discipleship here at the church. Discipleship is not just learning the Word of God. We know the Word of God. It's to apply the Word of God to what we know. When we can apply scripture, we are discipled. We are a follower of Jesus. We are a grower of the Lord. And then service. Service. The, the question is, how, how, how do we get plugged in? How do we get plugged in? How can I serve? How can I find some place to just get involved with, whether it, it is, is in the youth ministry, children's ministry, soccer, or whether it's worship? Or How can I get plugged in? And that is a very important question because m many people don't just come to church because they love the music or they love to hear Bruce speak. They come to join the church because they have a spiritual gift and God has empowered them to serve within the body of Christ. And if you want to serve, I ask you to find leaders or to ask questions of the, of the office to call me on Sunday and let's find a place where you can get plugged in and serve. And one of the things that we have to do is we have to talk about our giving. Every member, when they come to the office, the question is, uh, what, what is required of me? And we just ask every member to be part of the family. And when you're part of the family, you give. Uh, you give to every issue of the church. The matter of the heart is the heart of the matter. And the heart issue is very important. Our church struggles. And it's struggled since I've been here. And it was struggling way before I got here about the financial issues within the church. If every person of the church, every one of us, would sacrifice and give. And I look across and I see people that give systematically and they give generously to the church. What we have to do is we have to think, our church is my family. And if I want my family to be healthy, I don't want to do the things that we have to do in order to cut budget. I want to do things that we can do to grow the body of Christ, to add more ministries, to do great things for Christ. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 1 and 2, it says, Now concerning the collection for the saints... As I have given orders to the church of Galatia, so you must also do. For the first day of the week, let each one of you lay something aside, storing up as he has prospered, that there be no collection when I come. Lay aside and give. Give to the body of Christ. Allow the church to do great things. Now, we've all heard this scripture. We've all heard, how does the church, how does the church uh, thrive? The church is not here to make money, Period. If we have money coming in, money is going out. We are going to serve. We're going to do ministry. We're going to facilitate. We're going to make things happen. We're going to add new staff. We're going to add new ministry. We want to grow the church in a numerical, financial, systematic way that the church is always ministering to the individuals. Now, here's how we do that. In Malachi, it says this. Bring all your tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in my house. And prove me now wherewith, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. Room enough to receive it. He is going to rebuke the devourer. He is going to take care of every issue that we have if we are generous. And it's a condition of the heart. I found this poem. It talked about this is my church. It is composed of people just like me. You know, Glenville is very unique. It is unique that we don't have any rich people. We don't have any real poor people. What we have is we have individuals that just have a passion for Christ. But when we don't have rich people and we don't have poor people, I couldn't tell you maybe one or two people that give a, a large, large amount to the church. But what we have is we have a lot of people that just give systematically to the church. And if we have a lot of people that just give systematically to the church, we can do great things if we all band together. But what we do is we look, say, well, the doors were open last week. 
The snow was off the parking lot last week. The yard was mowed last week. The staff was taken care of last week. The air conditioner was on this week. We say, oh, everything is great. Everything's fine. But every time we are making cuts in every other area in order to make sure everything is taken care of. This is my church. It is composed of people just like me. If it will be friendly, if I am friendly. It will do great work if I work. It will make generous gifts to many causes if I am generous. It will bring others into the fellowship if I bring them. Its, its seats will be filled if I fill them. Therefore, with God's help, I dedicate myself to have the task of being all the things that I need to be to be a member of my church. It is all of us. All of us being part of the body of Christ. And I believe one of the biggest issues of the church is our missions. What is the church's approach to missions? In our society today, this generation, my generation, what am I going to get out of it? What's in it for me? And when we think about missions and the mindset of what am I going to get out of it, it changes everything about the direction of missions. The man that started this church, his name was J.J. Adrian, and he had a, a philosophy and a slogan, and it said this, missions is the right arm of the church. In other words, if we give up on missions and we do not give towards missions, then nothing else really matters. The command to give towards missions is saying this, the world is important. Every person in the world is my responsibility. The job of the church is not only to evangelize Wichita, Kansas. It's also my job to help evangelize the state of Kansas. It's also my job to the United States. It's also my job to help those that are wanting to go around the world. In Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All power is given unto you into heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. And then it changes to, to what Romans says in Romans chapter 10. And this is where it all gets, I want to explain. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And then they shall call upon him who they have not believed. And how shall they believe of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. It's not about the preacher. It's about the message of that preacher. Whether it's a preacher in Wichita or whether it's a preacher in Zambia, whether it's a preacher in Africa or China, the Bible says, how can they believe if they have not heard? And how can they hear if they do not go? And how can they go unless they are sent? How? God's economic plan for missions is the body of Christ, his church, bringing in the concept of the world is my responsibility. And I have missionaries all around the world that we, the church, has helped send out. And what we do is on a weekly basis, we give systematically to missions so a missionary can come in. We can interview that missionary and they have that same philosophy that we have. And we can help them get on the field and start their churches and win people for Jesus Christ. If missions is not important, listen. And I know this is a postmodern thought, but I want to give it to you. No one goes to heaven without the blood of Jesus Christ. You hear that? If you are in deepest, darkest parts of this world, how can they hear without a preacher? How could they believe unless one is sent? It is our job to not only have compassion for the people that walk in our doors. It's our job to have compassion for missions for anyone around the world. It is the greatest responsibility that we have as the body of Christ is to evangelize not only Wichita, Kansas, but around the world. And then those missionaries that come in here and they sacrifice and they say, I'm going to leave my family. I'm going to go to 
Africa. I'm going to go to India. I'm going to go to Sri Lanka. I'm going to go away, and I'll come back every four years for a few months to see my family. But my calling of my life is to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ to a dark world. What we have to say is, I'm in on that. I want to support that. I want to help that. And the job of the church is to support missions all around the world because no one can go to heaven without the power and the blood of Jesus Christ. That's our missions. And another question was brought to me, which is something that's very relevant and current to us. Does Glenville still have small groups? And the answer is, yes, we do. Um, but it's hurting. Our small group leader resigned Brennan uh, uh, Smith resigned um, um, just a few months ago. Uh, not Smith, Brennan Scott just resigned. As soon as I said Smith, I said, that's not right. And I had to thank my wife. Brennan Scott just resigned a few months ago. He had a baby and he was working at Spirit. And uh, our resources were not allowed to uh, take care of him in a full-time capacity uh, like we wanted to. Uh, so, so he resigned. Um, so what does our small groups look like? Uh, I believe small groups are very important. Uh, some of the negatives about the small groups was um, uh, not enough leadership. Not enough leadership. Uh, whether it's our teachers or our facilitators. It seemed to me that the, the people that were doing everything in the church was still doing the small groups as well. And if, if anything, if you do the same thing and everybody, we do the 5% that does everything has to do the 5% more things that we're going to continue to do, it's going to suffer. It's really going to struggle. So uh, the, one of the biggest issues that we have since Brennan left was our teachers and our facilit facilitators. Um, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 15, it says, Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor of the Lord is not in vain. So without leadership, things struggle. And we, we are going to start, I think it's what, next month we start a little series on Wednesday night on leadership within the church. How to not be a leader, but how to lead. How to take some leadership. So uh, I think not enough leadership and, and not having a facilitator in certain areas struggle, and our small groups need to really be revitalized. And I'm going to be honest with you, I don't know enough about small groups how to revitalize it. I, I, I need some help, and that's, that's why I brought Brennan on staff, and that's why I'm asking you, uh, you know what, if, if it is something that we need to do, we need to really wrap arms around small groups because it's very positive, but we need to have strong leadership. Um, and somebody may say, I want to be a leader, but I don't have a house that I can meet in. My house is too small. My heart is big. I want to do it, but my, my house is too small, and, and it's kind of dirty, and I don't want to necessarily clean the house every week. So uh, I want to do something, but my house is too small. We can always come up with different solutions for you to be involved and to help somebody else out. And another negative is I have child. I, I, don't, I have children. I don't have child care, and we want to make sure that we can evaluate that and make sure that takes place. And... Um, and here's one of our major issues. Small groups tend to contain who they know, who they're familiar with. And what we want to do is uh, with our small groups, we want to look across the auditorium and say, I want to build a relationship with you, and I want to build community with you. It's not necessarily who I know, it's who can I get to know. How can I share my life with you, and how can you share your life with me? In Psalms 32, 8, it says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you with my loving eyes on you. Some people need some encouragement. Some people just need some love. And then one of the questions may be, I just don't know enough Bible. I don't know enough Bible. I just don't know if I could teach. And, and I want to share that we have a resource that each and every one of you can use, not only in small groups, but also in your life, in your vision, and just in your learning. It's called Right Now Media. And Right Now Media is a tool that there are hundreds and thousands of Bible studies, lessons, videos for kids, movies, uh, marriage seminars, leadership seminars, every issue that you would ever want to go through, there's a video of leadership to teach you how to deal with it. It's called Right Now now media. And if you would like that, absolutely free. If you have kids, absolutely free. There's hundreds of VeggieTale movies 
There's hundreds of learning tools for your kids that they can just get in front of an iPad and instead of playing a game, they can learn and grow. And also in small groups, there's hundreds of small group lessons on Right Now Media that is absolutely free to you. It costs the church about $200 a month and it gives us access to give every person, every child within this church free access to leadership tools and learning tools. So, but what are the positives? I believe right now media is one of the positives that we can use. Uh, I think it builds closeness to a group that we can share our love for each other. We come into church. We come into church and we see people on those side and we see people on this side. And uh, we do, do I know you? Well, you, you go to my church. But to build closeness is God has empowered you. He has gifted you. And what he wants to do within you is to release that giftedness into somebody else's life. Now, Sunday morning church is good. We can sit there and we can be a member of the church and we can worship our Lord. We can fellowship. We can learn. We can even grow. But we don't necessarily share. Oh, uh, we can know a few people that's sitting around us and we can do a little bit with the people that we get to know. But to share community, they went from house to house breaking bread and had fellowship. The church, what it really needs to do, it needs not to just grow bigger, it needs to grow smaller. What does that mean? The smaller that we become, the bigger that we will be. The more people that you know within the body of Christ, the stronger the church will be. I have a good buddy of mine, I've used this illustration before, but I think it's so great. He started a church about seven years ago with a handful of people. And he said this to his handful of people. He said, I don't care how big we become, we need to remember where we came from. So those 20 people, or 25 people, now the church runs five, six, seven hundred people in five years. But you know what their philosophy is? To act like the church still has those 20 to 25 people in there. What does that mean? When they were 25 people and somebody walked in the door, how are you doing? What can we do? How can we serve you? How can we make things happen for you? Those 25 people made sure everybody felt comfortable. But what happened in the dynamics of the church is once we become large and there's an empty seat, everybody just goes in. Whether somebody waves at you and talks to you, that, that's up to where you're sitting and who's at the door that day. But if we had the mindset that our church needs to remain small, to grow big, every person that walks in that door, every person that's at the house of God is here for divine appointment from God. And it is our job to make them feel comfortable. It's our job, the body of Christ, to make them feel that they should be here. It gives us opportunity to invite new people from the church and in the community into a relationship with Christ. That's what it gets to do. And then the last question I'd like to address is probably one that um, is easy for you to understand. And, uh, but in our philosophy of our culture today, it is not popular. You could stand up and you could be on many talk shows and you make this statement and it's a very biblical statement. You would be laughed at, you'd be ridiculed, and you'd be called a bigot and a racist off this one statement. And the question is, is Jesus the Son of God and the only way to eternal life with God? Seems like a pretty innocent statement, doesn't it? Until somebody doesn't believe that Jesus is the only way. That Jesus is a way. Jesus could be a way. When we think that Jesus is a God and not the God. He is not a God. Jesus, God, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is the triune Godhead. When sin entered into this world, Jesus became the propitiation, the covering, the, the reconciliation of our life. No other God, no other being has died on the cross not to die but to die for a purpose. And that purpose is to cover our sins, to give us access back to God. Jesus himself said this. This is Jesus' words found in John chapter 14. I am the way. 
I am the truth, and I am the life. Next phrase. No one comes to the Father except through me. No one. What is the purpose of the church? What is the purpose of us coming together? No one comes to the Father except through me. So if I would ask, Glenville, what is the one major priority of the church? And the answer should be overwhelmingly to proclaim the name of Jesus. Jesus died for me. Jesus transformed me. Jesus forgave me. Jesus has empowered me. I believe the statements of the church. I understand the mission of the church. I understand giving to the church. Giving to the church to reach people for the cause of Jesus Christ. I understand the mission. I understand the purpose of small groups. Everything that this church does, everything that you do, should be wrapped around Jesus. Teaching your kids, going to school, going to work. We do things for the cause of Christ. But here's what happens. When the church gets so lackadaisical in their faith, the church becomes the least of the priority instead of the greatest priority. Jesus becomes somebody we worship on, some, but on Sunday, but not the person we worship every day. Jesus becomes somebody that we tip, but we do not tithe. Jesus becomes somebody that we may talk about if it is not uncomfortable, instead of standing face to face boldly and proclaim that Jesus is the answer to every issue. When you come into counseling, it is not about your needs, it's about your spiritual condition. How is your relationship with Jesus? Because Jesus can forgive you. Jesus can heal you. Jesus can help you. But when we put Jesus on the back burner and he is not the priority, what he's saying is, I want you. I died for you. I love you. If Jesus is not the priority, he is on the back burner and he cannot do the things he wants to do within your life. Jesus is not a way. The Bible says in John chapter 14, he is the way. Can you say that with me? I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. Next two words. No one comes to the Father except through me. The mandate of the church. I'm, t I'm speaking now. <laughs> Who said that? I'll tell you when you can talk, okay? And now is not the time. I'm just joking. I should have paused a little longer right there. The mandate of the church is to proclaim the message of Jesus Christ. So, some of the questions that were asked. I believe they're very good. I believe it's very important. What is the church? Why should I belong to a church? I have a good friend of mine that makes this statement, and I like this statement. If every church is like this church, why do we have this church? In other words, you can drive down Seneca Street, or you can go down 21st Street, or you can go down Tyler or, or Webb Road, and you know how many churches in Wichita, Kansas you're going to pass? Hundreds, maybe even thousands of churches. But here's what God does. God brings to the body, to the church, those that are saved and those that the church needs to add growth and strength to the body. Glenville, just like any other church in Wichita, Kansas, God brought you here to add growth, faith, and strength to the church. I think it's awesome that every church is different. I think it's great. I think every church should be uniquely different because of the gifts that God has brought into the church. It is not about your strengths or my strengths. It's what God wants for the body of Christ. And when God has brought you into the church, 
You have one responsibility. What can I do? How can I give my gifts? How can I give my resources? How can I proclaim the message of Jesus within my life? Because the church is God's institution to change the world. We are the feet. We are the voice piece for God. We are the ambassador that God has given to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ. Are you a member? Not a member of this church, but are you a member of the church? The member of God's church. And God takes his membership and he says, I want you here. I want you here. I need you here for a purpose. And that purpose is not to set and sour on Sunday morning and not like what's going on. If it's a set and sour and soak time, you're at the wrong church. Believe me, you're the wrong church. But if your job is you come to this church and you enjoy what's going on, you want to be part of the body of Christ, and you say, how can I serve? How can I love? You are at the right church because what we want to do is we want to grow not only in numbers. And we don't want to grow in numbers for numbers sake. We want to grow in numbers for salvation's sake so we can reach more people for the cause of Christ. So we can go around the world. We can invite more missionaries in. We can have more ministries going on. Why is that? Because God brings growth to his church. This is God's church. We are part of his team. He is the head of the church, the cornerstone of the church. Everything that is done, everything that has been done, should be done for the glory of God. There are all kinds of issues that have taken place. This is a church been here for 60 years, and there's a lot of water under the bridge. There's been a lot of great days. There's been a lot of sad days. There's a lot of times I'm on the mountaintop looking down, calling my buddies and telling them how great Glenville is. But just the next Monday, I could be in the lowest depths of wondering what in the world's going on. It is an ebb and flow roller coaster ride of life called ministry and called the church. Whether we're on the mountaintop and everything's great, or we're in the valley where everything seems dim, what we are is we are family. And what family does is when somebody is in the valley, we crawl down the hill, wrap our arms around them, and take them to the top. Because one day, you'll be in the valley, and you'll need somebody to crawl down that hill and pick you up and encourage you and love you. Because guess what? That's what family does. We are family. I just watched a TV show a couple of days ago. We Are Marshall. Remember that song? We are, or that, that movie, We Are Marshall? They just lost the entire football team and they stood together and they chanted, We are Marshall. And what we are is we are the church. Be strong. Be ready. The adversary wants to trip you up. But Jesus wants to give you strength, power, and authority.